you know, you, what do you mean you don't love humanity, Jewel? But what was that little crack about, stir about you don't love humanity? <sighs> People scare better when they're dying, Gordon. I'm resident of color with the... <laughs> he, he went to Florida and he said he didn't love a huge manatee. <laughs> And again, I like I said, we need to keep that this this innuendo and the smutty talk off off the podcast. I'm starting to get uncomfortable. I agree. Oh but by the way, we're triggered. That that line that line is from my favorite western, Once Upon a Time in the West. Um, Frank says that Henry Fonda's character. So, so so there are manatees in the, in in Once Upon a Time in the West, is what you're saying? No, they're magnificent. Uh, no, no. Uh, Once Upon a Time in the West is all sand porn. It's all sand desert. It's a very very good movie. Um, but morning. this, this, mind you, has uh, no no desert porn, unfortunately. Um, which that, that, that but there's gross. but there's swamp porn, which is more important. But so uh, the, we're here to review the 1939, the Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, which was written by Arthur, Arthur Sir Arthur Donan Coyle, uh, who who created Sherlock Holmes, wrote Sherlock Holmes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you guys, you guys suggested this movie. I watched it. It, it was all right. Um, so when did you guys first see this movie? Yeah, it's it's going to be a long night. <sighs> Gordon, go, go ahead. Okay, well, I first saw this movie when I was a kid. And there are... Um, <clears throat> and this was part of the initial wave of Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce... Sherlock Holmes movies that got syndicated to television. And, and, and I can, I can, you know, I think I can pretty much tell why Jewel may not like this movie because it's, it's very sedate. It's very, it's very much a, um, an atmosphere piece. Um, I could also understand because Sherlock Holmes has been kind of overexposed for the last 15 years, but also what, what, what people don't take away is this is actually a God, um, when Conan Doyle wrote this novel, this was 10 years after he ended Sherlock Holmes in The Adventure of the Final Problem. Because people were saying, you should do more home stories. And, and Doyle's like, no, read The White Company. Read my, read my boxing novels. Read, read everything else. And he saw himself as a historical romantic. You know, He wrote historical romances, which nobody read. People wanted Holmes. So he writes House of the Baskervilles deliberately as a gothic novel. Um, and yes, Jewel, this is a gothic novel. Gothic is more than just horror. Um, but he also wrote this with the idea that, um, you know, it was all about, it was a flashback to Holmes. But getting back to the movie, I just think it's a really good, it's a nice, tight, little, little, little film. It's probably one of the better of the uh, Baskerville of the Hunter the Baskerville um, uh, adaptations, um, with the second being the Hammer version in 1959. But now I, you know, I just I like it. It's it's you know you can't go wrong with Rathbone and Bruce. And we and we and, and we we drove Jewel out of the room, didn't we? He is gone. I was doing my Jewel. I wasn't looking at the monitor, and there he's he's vanished. He's back. Damn it. Well, what sort of pants are you wearing? We were speculating from a distance. Well, first of all, I'm not I'm not wearing pants. I'm wearing shorts. Are they made of wear, lycra? I never wear pants. I wear shorts. It's like Dracula said that. I never wear pants. I never wear pants. Ask my wife. Ask Julie Sains. If any if nobody believes me, message my wife on Facebook. Um, I don't believe you. I I I don't. Yeah, think I believe you too. I I believe in America. <laughs> <laughs> what well, What was your question? I'm sorry. I was talking to my daughter. If you're out in the middle of the ocean and all four wheels fall off, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> the answer is Roquefort. Wrong, because a vest has no sleeves. You're right. Yeah. God. Um, so what did you what did you what did you think of this movie, Patrick? I'm sorry. Yeah. When did you first see it? I saw it in uh, very early 19. 
uh, 80, 81. I said, so it'd be around the same time Gordon did. And, uh, and my mother had a good, good mom moment. You know, she's an English teacher and she came home and it was on the, uh, post 11 PM news Sunday movie. And she said, stay up for this. Great. I'd heard about Sherlock Holmes, but I'd never really seen any Sherlock Holmes. And um, I think like Gene Wilder's movie was the closest that I came. And uh, and it just, if you go to Mount Rushmore and you see those faces carved there, whether it is a, a travesty towards the Native Americans or not, is in this case kind of not the central point, although I'm sort of obligated to say it. Um, you feel like, man, this is what they look like. It's not going to get any more presidenty than these giant faces in rock carved out of a mountain, kind of like an Alex Ross painting. It's like, this is what they look like. And so even though Nigel Bruce deviates wildly from the character as uh as written and the dynamic is you know resultingly different it is the er holmes you know it is it is arguably is not the best sherlock holmes movie this sort of thing where if someone just sees one and they want to get holmes and they want to get the vibe of holmes that informed how every generation would see the character, even if they've never seen the movie or the resulting films that came after it. This is it. You know, Basil Rathbone is great in everything, but he's really, really, really good in this. And, you know, that goes for the rest of the cast, but there was just something, he was born to play the part. It's like, you know, you can watch Jeremy Brett, who, in my opinion, is the finest Sherlock Holmes I've seen. I, I really, really like him. And Robert Stevens, who's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But, um, but uh, something about Rathbone, and something about Rathbone with Bruce, just gets to the heart of one of the most important, one of the best known and one of the most enduring characters of the 20th century. I, I would probably say, um, you know, of course, starting a little bit in the 19th century, I would say probably uh, the greatest literary character of the 20th century. In, mm -hmm. in when, when, when we get past the Gatsby stuff, because, you know, Tarzan is just a guy in a vine. Sorry, Eddie, but it's true. And that has not really stayed with us. To the same extent, uh, Superman, Batman, those guys came later. James Bond came later. This, this character, I think, really is modernism's answer to what a hero needs to be. And, mm -hmm. and it's like, it's any argument that we live in a simulation is given credence because basil rathbone is just perfect in the part mm -hmm. um i took the time today to not just watch this version uh i watched the version with um oh jesus the the uh 1950s version of this uh oh movie. with peter cushing yeah 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 um who plays Sherlock Holmes in that movie. And both movies are interesting. Now, this movie, to me, is... It's a lot more gothic, not just because it's in black and white. I will say that the color version has a gothic feel to it, very much. Mm -hmm. um, I do like the fact that in the color version, they're, they're playing to the same psychology to a large degree. Now, with this, with the black and white version, the thing I like the most is I do like the gothic feel, too, because, hey, Dark Shadows is gothic horror. And this is, too. Now, 
Am I a big Sherlock Holmes fan? No, I'm not. And I would never claim to be. Um, I will say that this is a good story. It's a fun thing to watch. You're not going to get bored with it. Um, you know, it builds the suspense right away. It builds the, okay, what's really going? Because here's the thing. When I watched this movie, I was remembered to an actual historical event where I believe in France this happened, where an animal was attacking people and everybody thought it was a wolf. Uh, that was attacking people. Well, it wasn't a wolf uh, for historical uh, preference. It was a hyena. A man had trained a hyena uh, to kill people. And it was that man who killed mm -hmm. the hy his own hyena with a what he called a silver bullet. Uh, he didn't use a silver bullet. He used a regular bullet. Uh, but he killed his own pet, but he also trained this pet to kill people. And many historians suspect that the the uh, the king of, or the king of France at the time for hiring this man to kill said his own people. Uh, it was a way to convert him to uh, I think Christianity. Mm -hmm. But this this story here, I don't know if it's directly mm -hmm. taken from that. I think some of it is um, because. A lot of it feels like it is because they use it. Somebody takes a dog and basically trains it to kill, which isn't hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, You've done it many times. You told us. About it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Conan Doyle did know. He did know some history. And I think that story was one of the influences on this. On Hound of the Baskervilles was that he wasn't a. <clears throat> Conan Doyle didn't pull. The, the stuff out of thin air. A lot of times he would pull from like Sherlock Holmes was based on his, his teacher, Dr. Joseph Bell. Um, and, and so that's the other thing with the, the hammer remake is that it kind of, a lot of the original script had been modified because hammer wanted more of a horror movie than an actual Gothic kind of mystery. But the other thing is that Peter Cushing was a very avid Sherlockian scholar. So like he would go through the script and little pieces of business that, that Holmes does, he would actually make sure it was in the script that he would do on screen. And in fact, I don't know if there are any episodes that are still existing in the BBC vault, but he actually played to Holmes on, um, on the BBC in like the earlier mid sixties for like a, a season or a series or two. So, you know, these are two, and but these are two scripts that are very mired in Sherlockian lore. They're not the. And I think it's. I think I can understand where where more modern audiences because they're used to a different version of this character, and the fact that this character and I would argue, in the well. In the early mid seventies, there's the were beginning of a revival of Sherlock Holmes that that kind of culminated with the Seven Percent Solution, written by Nicholas Meyer. And I would argue that in the past fifteen or twenty years, we've seen, and um, and I will say this out loud, and I'll start an argument. I think Sherlock has been overexposed because you've got the BBC mm -hmm. version, mm -hmm. as good as it is. You've got the elementary version. You've got the those. The, guy the movies were that the, it's the Jude Law as Watson movies because he's the, the only reason you watch them. Yeah, Guy Ritchie. Those two films. Uh, let's see what else is there. Is there another one? Well, Nicholas Meyer started writing books again. Kareem Abdul Jabbar started writing books about it. Um, and um, and then you have. Uh, uh, for for better or worse, the uh, the the Will Ferrell. Yeah, I was trying not to mention that. I yeah, it's uh, it's I, not a good movie. Yeah, um, I uh, kind of liked it. I kind of liked it. I mean, no accounting for taste, but um. Uh, well, we're I, both of this I, podcast, so our, our our taste is questionable at best. Well, here we go. But it's <laughs> um, it's got it's um, 
It's a really interesting film because, you know, the same people made Vice in the same year, which was nominated for Best Picture. And um, it's a really – here's the saving grace. Now we'll get out of it because it's not about that movie. It's about another one. But the thing about that movie, about Holmes and Watson, is it has the audacity to be really weird – as if it's Sherlock Holmes made by people who'd never heard of Sherlock, never, never seen or read a Sherlock Holmes story. And so it's like something recreated by a computer about what they think it might be. And, and that takes it in such a bizarre tangent that it, it didn't offend me as much as if they had known the mythos better and just got it wrong. At least it's, they got it wrong for something that they didn't really impinge upon. Yeah, it's and there are like, a few weird of, gags. Yeah, it's like. kind of like if you asked AI to write a Sherlock Holmes screenplay. Yeah, yeah, and and put in an Alan Menken song. Right. And it's a decent Alan Menken song. Who knew? Uh, but yeah, but that's not that's not what we're talking about. Oh, no. but uh, okay. So um, I'm trying to think of any other Sherlockian things, and the uh, I think that's it. Uh, well, House. Honestly, mm -hmm. I think you could put House in there. Oh yeah, as... they, they 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 played that up um, during its run. So so yeah, I think yeah. this character has been a little bit. I think for major media, it's like, you know how every few years there's a King Arthur movie and every few years there's a Robin Hood movie? I think we're in the point where in every few years there's going to be a uh, Sherlock Holmes movie. There's something interesting, though, when the I, I think it's kind of wacky. So the 70s, you had a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of ground to a halt mid 80s you know steven spielberg young sherlock holmes and then you had um uh without a clue and that stopped it and there was once the brett series went off the air i i don't think there was anything substantial there's something weird with patrick mcnee i remember watching uh yeah there's sherlock holmes in new york there are a couple well, of that was 70s Okay. Oh, you're. I think you're. Um, I'm Christopher into the Lee 80s and point. Patrick McNee did a couple in the '90s. That's okay. Those are the ones I'm thinking about. But but uh, but really, excluding those because they were just kind of sad. Uh, I don't remember anything Sherlockian. Well, a until, lot of it. Until well, hang on. Until the Guy Ritchie. I mean, between between without a clue and the Guy Ritchie movie. I, what do we have? And that was a long drought. Yeah, yeah, and part of that was the the Conan Doyle estate, because really, what here's what happened, um, and 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 you know, well, you know, I I think <clears throat> people buckle up. It's going to be a long drawn out speech. So, you know, if you need to pause, get some coffee. No, I understand. I've, I've I've done many of them. It's my turn to listen. Okay. So the last of Arthur Conan Doyle's heirs passed away in the 70s, his son Adrian. So they were trying for that for that year. They couldn't find any direct descendants. So they had to spend some time finding like the the great nieces and nephews of Conan Doyle's family. And so once they got. Once they they found them, they could kind of start going, OK, how do we give this approval? Um, the other, so that's one factor. The other factor, ironically, was that most of the Conan Doyle material, except for one book, was public domain. And the one book was the case book of Sherlock Holmes. Do either of you remember a case in 2013 about Sherlock Holmes going to the, the U.S. Supreme Court? Okay, well... Let me introduce you to your name, uh, a gentleman by the name of Les Klinger. Yeah. Les Klinger is a noted Sherlockian. He's a noted Bram Stoker expert. And in like 2012, he was going to publish a book 
of Sherlock Holmes stories. And some of these contain material from the casebook of Sherlock Holmes, which it was published in 27. So everything else had been stopped around 1911. So that all but this book had been public domain. And um, the Conan Doyle estate, um, because it's the business arm of the estate, said, nope, you can't publish it. Klinger, and I think it's uh, Laurie King, who is his co-editor, said, like, look, this stuff is public, you know, the character's public domain, the content's public domain, and we're going to go ahead and, you know, I think we can go ahead and do it. And the estate said, well, you can do that. And if you try to publish your book, we will reach out to Amazon and other booksellers and say, this is against, you know, you're violating copyright. And what the estate would do is they would show up to a filmmaker. So let's say, let, let's say that Jewel is a producer and he's, he's, you know, it's the mid to late nineties. And he's like, I'm going to do Halloween 12, Michael Myers versus Sherlock Holmes. The estate will come in and say, okay, well, you're using Sherlock Holmes. You, you owe us a, a licensing fee. And, and, Jewel, you know, Jewel would say, well, wait, public domain. Um, see, see, I'm starting to bore Patrick already, people, but stay, it gets better. And so they would they would get a preemptive. Guys, I'm sorry, there's a thing that happened. Oh, no problem. I was I, I'm no problem. I apologize for the for any for any offense. Um, so anyway, uh, I'll try not to put you to sleep, Jewel. Um, anyway, they're doing preemptive stuff, but basically Klinger sued them. And said, okay, well, they they sued Clink because Clinger's also an intellectual property lawyer. Um, mm-hmm. so he knows about public domain. Um, they asked, he asked for a summary judgment, you know, can anyone use Sherlock Holmes? Yes. The estate appealed and they took it all the way to the US Supreme Court, who said, Yes, Sherlock Holmes, everything is public domain, anyone can use it. You can't keep charging people. Yeah. So yeah, so that's and and I was writing for, well, I was writing for I Hear Sherlock at the time, so I had a ground seat. I I had a, uh, I had I had a ringside view, as it were. Nice, nice. <laughs> Damn. And not uh, only that, the great thing about Sherlock Holmes being public domain is that anybody can write a story. Even, and the reason I know this, and I want to point, if you purchase this fine book by Belandra Books called Sherlock Holmes, A Year a Year of Mystery, 1884, it's one story per month for a year in the life of Sherlock Holmes. Look, see, see? Very That's nice. That's me. That's great. Congratulations. Very nice. Very nice. I do have a question for you guys with this movie. In this movie, Sherlock Holmes dons a disguise. So, was that in Arthur Conan Doyle's books? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, that was one of his great talents. Was as a master of disguise. Yeah, and the and the whole Watson learns that Holmes has been there all the time. <laughs> that's in the book. As he's claiming to be Holmes. <laughs> Which I, I really like. Now, Jewel, if if um, I would I would almost say if you if you didn't like this movie as much as Gordon and I did, there's a movie you really I think would work. You know, you know, you know, Billy Wilder, who made Sunset Boulevard and yeah, I've seen uh, Starlight Seventeen and, and some that. some like it. Yeah, well, I'm just making sure we all know who he is. Uh, he made a Sherlock Holmes movie. And, you know, when Wilder decided to take on a genre, he pretty much did the best of whatever that genre could be. You know, there would be other other projects that would equal what he would do, but none that would top it. Some like it hot for comedy, for instance, or uh, a double indemnity for noir. And, and in some ways, he would give it a little extra edge, a little extra boost. Well, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, which was originally intended to be a three-hour road picture, um, they take it around and so on and so forth, 
is uh, truly fantastic. And you have uh, Christopher Lee in one of his, I think, two performances as Mycroft. Uh, where else is, is it 7%? What, what else is he, is Christopher Lee Mycroft in? Oh, I'm, I am completely he's, blanking. He's Mycroft twice. Um, we have Christopher Lee as Mycroft and um, you have Robert Stevens, now best known as Sir Robert Stevens, as the husband of Magenta in Rocky Horror Picture Show, Patricia Quinn. Uh, so sort of the David Ford, Nancy Barrett of England. Um, but he, he's marvelous. And the movie is sparkling. It It is a little more character-oriented. It is a little more comedy-oriented, but it's comedy that remains believable. It has a nice sort of proto-steampunk uh subtext it's you got Loch Ness monster mm -hmm. um is in it and you have an actor named Colin Blakely as Watson and although he's not quite the Watson of the novels and oddly enough for me Robert Duvall comes awfully close to being how I imagine Watson as being uh he's my favorite Watson He's just, he steals the movie. Uh, and there's a scene involving the Bolshoi ballet and backstage at the Bolshoi ballet that is hands down, I think, one of the most perfectly directed comedy scenes uh, ever. But the whole movie's very good. And I strongly encourage you to take a look. Yeah. And it's also available on Tubi. So there you go. It's a fine movie. I'm going to watch it again tonight. I really like that film. Mm -hmm. uh, what's you guys' favorite scene in this movie that we're talking about? Oh, I I like the moment between uh, Rathbone and Bruce. Uh, the, yeah. the 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 D the D costuming. That to me just that because it has such elan. It's just it's so light in that moment, but it feels. Uh, true to the to the to the spirit of fun that mm -hmm. that you would get uh, occasionally in the in the home stories where it really just kind of elevated to a new level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine too. Ah, I like the uh, scene where the dog comes out of the the hole where the owners take the guy's taking the shoe and he's having the dog sniff it. It's really terrifying once you see this and <laughs> like it's like by God. And and what's interesting about Rathbone and Bruce is that after another film for Fox, which I think is like the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, the series moves to Paramount. Um, and basically it's Sherlock Holmes in the 1940s fighting Nazis. Yeah. So you've got like yeah. the voice of terror, the, the secret weapon dressed mm -hmm. to kill. And those are really interesting movies. Isn't there one about a Ray? Is there an invisible ray that works its way in there somewhere? Um, I think I, there may be. I don't know if that's. I don't think there's a Sherlock Holmes and the Invisible Ray. I but think I just think, the Invisible Ray was a, yeah. a separate thing. Uh, this whole movie, the way it's filmed, black and white, is really good. Now I have a question: Did they use the same location for the '50s movie or no? No, no. The the the. The movie, the 1939 movie was shot in the United States. Okay. The 1959 movie was shot in England. Okay. Because that's cool. a Hammer film. Cool, cool. Um, with, this with this movie, what did you guys think of the whole Moors then? I like how they made, like, both versions look terrifying. It's, it's well, it's just, it's perfectly atmospheric setting it's it's uh it out foggy london's foggy london in a way by right. having this element of, of being antique and i just felt like i was watching a lot of dark shadows yeah. you know i mean the the design of the house and the interior and the staircase uh and dartmoor where you know which is what where garth blackwood was the master of dartmoor yeah. prison crime yeah, and after crime yeah, and and the the writers would have been old enough to have se I'd seen this like either first time around or probably more likely in like a second run theater. Yeah, 
The, uh, by the way, the one guy in this movie is digging up graves. <laughs> he's digging up bodies or something. Uh, or he's a grave robber or something. So, which I found funny because I kept thinking about Willie Loomis opened up Barnabas's coffin. She tries to steal. Joel, Joel, let me ask, what did you think of the last line of, of the movie? Last line of the movie. I forget what the last slide was. Watson, Normal. the needle. Oh. <laughs> because he split his pants. <laughs> and he needed him to sew up his pants. Yeah. It's funny. That's funny. I did the scene I like. I talked about the dog scene. The other scene I like before the disguise reveal is when you see Sherlock, you don't know it's Sherlock Holmes when I first because I watched this for the first time today. Is like Sherlock Holmes selling that he's this other dude, <laughs> he's just walking through the moors like without a care in the world. <laughs> it's like well, of... I, you know, the needle gives you a lot of energy and focus, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And 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 in Victorian England, people found a lot of a lot of people used a lot of needles and that's all I'm saying. Even Sigmund Freud. Which now, explains uh, a lot. Joel, have you ever seen 7% solution? 17% solution. No, no, the 7% the seven percent solution. I think you'd, you'd like that. It was an early novel by Nicholas Meyer who made no, Star Trek 2. I don't think I have. But... It's really good. And in that... Uh, uh, Holmes is fooled into going to Vienna to team up with Sigmund Freud to solve a crime. And as it turns out, it's an elaborate ruse to kind of get him. There, there actually is a crime going on, of course, but uh, it's, it's also an elaborate ruse to get him working with Freud to cure him of his uh, cat on his head, to cure him of his uh, uh, cocaine addiction. Which is, you know, the needle is referring to, and seven percent solution is about, you know, seven percent cocaine to, uh, uh, I guess, ninety three percent Powerade. Yes. And man. Yeah, those Victorians love their Powerade. They did. They did. A little too much. They mix it with clotted cream. Yeah. Why? We're we're just pulling it right. <laughs> they actually mix it with with Vegemite. <laughs> God. But they yeah. actually went to war to Ch they actually invaded China because China wouldn't give them tea. They got a lot of trouble over tea. If they had given up the whole tea thing, I think maybe well, yeah. life would have been easier. Yeah. yeah, it's funny because like like England goes to tea, goes to China and says, Hey, we wanna we want to we'd like to trade you some stuff for tea. The Chinese say no. And in the punitive, edition, uh, punitive expedition of 1895, Britain said, Oscar, we'll take over, we'll take your tea, and we'll give you opium. You know what was different in the 50s that I liked? It was nice to see Christopher Lee play somebody who, was, who, who they were trying to kill. It wasn't this bad guy. <laughs> He had Peter Cushing trying to save his ass. Well, that's 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 why Christopher Lee took that role. And and the scene with the tarantula where where yeah. he looks scared, that wasn't acting. Christopher Lee hated spiders. Oh wow! Wow. So so that that, that the look on his face that's not acting. Oh wow! That's uh, he also that's... hated people who wore shorts around the house. So just putting that out there. He he loved people. He loved women who wore lycra pants, though. <laughs> and I mean love, not loved, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yes, I, I think I caught your drift there. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think if, there, if there's anything I want to ask about this movie. I don't think so. Is there anything you guys want to add more about it? No, I think it's, I think we're good. It's a great movie. It is. It's a fun watch. Um, what are you guys doing tomorrow night? Anything? Uh, I would be very happy to talk about one of the other films we we discussed. I think that would be a nice a nice uh, uh, two part. I I would be perfectly happy to talk about. I either, I think because I think they're both on Tubi, Seven Percent Solution or or Private Life. I, I know, know Private, Private Life. Um, 
is on Tubi. I'm not sure about 7% solution. Let's it's talk private life. Let's talk private life tomorrow night. Uh, is 10.30 good, guys? 10.30 is good. It's okay with me. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Gordon and Patrick for the recommendation of this movie. It was a fun watch. Uh, both versions, actually, both the Hammer version and the 1939 version. If you guys want to go check those out, both movies are on Tubi for free. Um, link to Patrick McCray's Dark Shadows Daybook. Unbound is going to be the description box. Link to Gordon Demowski's Amazon page is going to be the description box. You guys have a good night, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Good night.